All right, so uh, let's talk about cockroaches. <laughs> so one autumn day, a visitor to my workplace, Pendixie Fossil Park and Nature Reserve, asked me, is it true that cockroaches live forever? And it got me thinking about extinction. Our guest was hunting for trilobite fossils. Although most people have never heard of a trilobite, a small but enthusiastic culture has coalesced around the collection of the remains. Can you be more specific, I responded to our guest. Back when I was teaching, this expression came in handy when I was confused by a student's question. <laughs> really works, and you sound smart. <laughs> <laughs> so can you be specific, I asked. Sure, the visitor replied. Why is it that they will never go extinct? I jumped a little bit. This was a great question. Now, as a graduate student at the University of Arizona, I lived with various roommates in various apartments in the beautiful desert town of Tucson. <laughs> so you know about what's coming up. Be besides the relentless heat, one thing that stands out about this time was the cockroaches. Like in many warm cities in the Americas, Tucson's cockroaches were larger than you could imagine, and they often invaded your home during the wet monsoon season. They typically entered through cracks, or if you were especially unlucky, via the sewer. It only happened once, but I still have nightmares about that time a cockroach crawled out through the shower drain. There's, there's more to come, <laughs> brace yourself. <laughs> So, so to combat the problem, the city of Tucson offered a hotline that you could call when things got especially bad. Uh, a technician would come out and apply a pesticide to your pipes that eradicated subterranean cockroach breeding grounds. Now, sadly, this service was not called Roachbusters. <laughs> now, there are nearly 5,000 cockroach species on Earth. But most are not considered pests, and only a few live among us in our cities and homes. Cockroaches thrive in warmer climates, but they can make do in colder regions, too. And that's not all. In 2007, Russian scientists, for the first time, successfully bred an animal in space. Can you guess what it was? Yes! And incidentally, the mama cockroach was named Hope. <laughs> and she has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> so at four centimeters in length, the American cockroach is the largest of all common cockroach species. And crawling out of your bathtub, it's hard to miss. They, uh, cockroaches uh, prefer to nest outdoors, but near buildings. They can squeeze through spaces smaller than a quarter and can eat just about anything including fabric, hair, skin cells, paper, dead insects, and even Taco Bell. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. true. They truly are wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, in hard times, uh, cockroaches can actually live for a week without water and up to a month without food. They are extremely agile and can move at the equivalent speed of a human running at 210 miles per hour. They also have highly sensitive vision due to large compound eyes, each of which contains over 2,000 individual lenses. If pursued with a fly swatter, say up a wall, a cockroach can choose to fly right at you. <laughs> so it's unclear, it's unclear if this aerial attack is simply a panic move or part of a more brilliant strategy. <laughs> what is clear is the consequence. You can't sleep until you've caught and killed the perpetrator. <laughs> so how do you kill the cockroach? Spoiler, it's actually really easy to kill a cockroach. Traditionally, one shoe is involved. <laughs> uh, either on foot or held in hand. And a quick whacking motion is all that's needed. 
Now, to ensure the kill, I recommend a full body blow, <laughs> aka a squishing gut buster. If you miss, be warned. Cockroach legs and wings are not essential and can regenerate after loss. Likewise, simply beheading a cockroach is not instantly fatal. After tormenting you for a few more days, a headless roach will eventually die from dehydration. <laughs> so, so how about killing groups of cockroaches? So a trip to my local garden center <laughs> reveals an entire aisle full of poisons, including nerve gases, chemicals which disrupt cellular function, and even nicotine. With global sales of over $80 billion, surely the pesticide industry has the cockroach on the run. Well, yes and no. Pesticides work very well, at least the first few times. Unfortunately for us, cockroaches use mass production to increase their odds of survival. Uh, once mature, the female American cockroach can lay eggs monthly. This adds up to 200 eggs in her two-year lifespan. Remember Hope, the space cockroach? She had 33 babies after returning to Earth. Somewhere in Russia, Hope's great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren are still crawling around. With such a fast reproductive rate, cockroaches can rapidly adapt to changing conditions. Now, here's a hypothetical situation. Let's say that you move into a new apartment and you learn that you have hundreds of roach roommates. Your landlord uses a pesticide, leaving behind one female survivor. After all, RAID is much more efficient than Avengers villain Thanos, who can only eliminate one half of a population with a snap of his fingers. If you ask me, his quote-unquote superpower would actually stink at killing cockroaches. Anyway, that one, that one female stuck around because she had a random change in her DNA an error that turned out to be useful. It makes her and her children raid-proof. But wait, there's no males left. No problem. Cockroaches can also reproduce asexually, meaning all by themselves. <laughs> they, they dig the bachelor life. <laughs> <laughs> so within one year, that single remaining roach can repopulate your apartment to pre-pesticide levels. And since RAID is no longer effective, you'd even settle for Thanos and his mediocre superpowers. <laughs> now, besides these freakish traits, evolution has gifted the cockroach with something even more valuable in times of trouble. But before we can talk about death on a global scale, we need some groundwork. In the broadest sense, Ecologists use two terms to describe species, generalists and specialists. According to Wikipedia, a generalist species thrives in a variety of environments and uses a variety of resources, while a specialist species thrives only in one environment or has a limited diet. So, how would you classify cockroaches? Yes, they are generalists. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, isn't it usually better to be a generalist? And the answer, at least in a changing global climate, is absolutely. On the other hand, dinosaurs, with their inability to adapt, are the most famous victims of global change. But if you really want to sound like an extinction expert at parties, then you need to know about an even cooler animal, the trilobite. There he is. Breathtaking. <laughs> In Latin, trilobite means three-lobed, which is very literal and far less inspiring than, say, the name dinosaur, which means terrible lizard. <laughs> Though modest in name and stature, trilobites were far more successful than dinosaurs. They appear in rocks dated to 520 million years ago which was well before the first animals set foot on land. Prior to this time, most life was microscopic and did not leave many fossils behind. During a time called the Cambrian Explosion, animals diversified, formed hard shells, and grew eyes, 
Life was finding a way. Trilobites burst out of the evolutionary gate with new features that gave them a huge advantage over their competitors. They had two compound eyes, which observed better than anything else in the ocean at the time. In fact, trilobite eyes were so advanced that they're still in use today by modern insects such as the cockroach. Like the cockroach, trilobites were built to last. For protection, they had a hard exoskeleton made from a biopolymer called chitin, which is present today in modern crustaceans and insects, including, of course, the cockroach. If a predator threatened, a trilobite could roll itself into a little ball and wait out the danger. We know a lot about trilobites because trilobite fossils are found on every continent. Some trilobites were small, just a few millimeters from head to tail, and others grew as large as a sheet pizza. Now, since we're in Buffalo and I'm using food for reference, it's fair to say that the typical trilobite was no larger than a chicken wing. <laughs> to grow, trilobites shed their exoskeletons just like the cockroach. Since this occurred many times, we find countless trilobite fossils. These sections, which are mainly head and tail pieces, are referred to by fossil collectors as trilobits. <laughs> now, if you're out digging and you happen to find a fossil that looks like this one, congratulations, you found a trilobut. <laughs> trilobites laid eggs. We know this because we found trilobite fossils with eggs attached to their heads. Horseshoe crabs, among the closest living relatives of trilobites, also carry eggs with them. This isn't for show. It's to give the young a better chance of survival. Can you guess which other animal parents the same way? The cockroach! <laughs> now, I could go on and on about the similarities between cockroaches and trilobites, but at this point, I'm beating a dead fossil. <laughs> now, at this juncture in my talk, you should have enough geeky trivia to be the life and or death of the party for many years to come. <laughs> and perhaps you'll clean your home a little more often. But you came here for an idea, and now it's time for me to pull this together. 250 million years ago, Earth experienced a devastating global extinction known as the Great Dying. It was the most catastrophic loss of life in our planet's history. 96% of all marine species were wiped out in a geological instant. That's as if 400 people came to see my talk, and midway through, 384 of them abruptly disappeared from their seats. <laughs> Go, going for a different effect here. <laughs> so no trilobite survived the great dying. All of their advanced evolutionary superpowers could not save them from a bitter and tragic finale. Post-apocalypse, it was a bleak world. The trilobite's distant cousin, the cockroach, pulled through, but barely. After the great dying, life on land took millions of years to recover. Today, we're in the midst of another great die-off. Our consumption of natural resources has increased the global extinction rate to 1,000 times higher than it was before humans came along. We are losing biodiversity at an alarming rate, no matter where you live or which newspaper you read. Forget the polar bear. For crying out loud, bumblebees, a critical pollinator of our food, are now endangered. So I ask, if the trilobite can die, can the cockroach also be killed? Like both of them, Humans are generalists. Will we face our own day of reckoning? I'll borrow from author Samuel Beckett, whose fittingly named play, Endgame, considered the tragedy of the human condition. You're on Earth, he wrote. There's no cure for that. But there's one thought that gives me hope, one gift we have that cockroaches don't, one evolutionary advantage that sets us apart. We have each other. Thank you.